So today, you know, we're going to do, a, uh, there's going to be actually two. We're going to actually end chapter 17. Uh, we're in Matthew chapter 17, verses 22 through 27. We're going to talk about Jesus again predicts his death and resurrection. And then we're also going to talk about Peter and his master pay their taxes. And uh, so let's go ahead and read Matthew chapter 17, verses 22 through 27. It says, verses 22 says, Now, while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and, and the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And when they had come into Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the temple tax? He said, Yes. And when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes? From their sons or strangers? And Peter said to him, From strangers. And Jesus said to him, Then the sons are free. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take, a, take the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened its mouth, you'll find a piece of money. Take, it, take that and give it to them for me and you. So when we look, when we go back, we look, we see that the first part was, is actually, is in Mark. You know, I, I like to do the parallels. So if you, you turn to Mark chapter 30, I mean, Mark chapter 9, verse 30 through 32, and actually Luke chapter 9, verse 43 and 45. And we'll find more instances to the story of actually where he predicts his death and resurrection, right? We'll see that a, a, a lot more detail in there. And we want to go over that first before we go into about the temple tax. So when we look now at Mark chapter 9, verse 30 and 32, it says, Then they departed from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know it. For he taught his disciples and said to them, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and after he is killed, he will, be, he will rise the third day. But they did not understand this saying and were afraid to ask him. Luke goes on, and that's in Luke chapter 9, verse 43 and 45. It says, And they were all amazed at the majesty of God. But while everyone marveled at all the things of which Jesus did, he said to his disciples, Let these words sink down into your ears. For the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand it, understand this saying. It was hidden from them, so they did not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. So as we see, we see a lot of more uh, information here. We see that, that they had departed. He didn't want people to follow him. He wanted to be back along with his disciples. And uh, we also see, you know, that they were afraid to even ask him. And they were sorrowful that, they, you know, that, that this was about. And it was hidden. It actually says it was hidden from them. So as we go and explore this part, I, I wanted to uh, bring out all those points through them. So... One thing I will tell you is that Jesus and him telling his disciples over and over again that he was going to die and be betrayed, be betrayed and be raised the third day. You know, one thing's for sure is that his death didn't take him by surprise. It's not that he was surprised. Oh, wow, they're, they're fixing to kill me. 
And, it, you know, he was telling them exactly what was going on. He knew. And that right there goes in to show that he had total control over his death. You know, I've heard many people uh, tell people that, you know, that the Romans killed Jesus or that, that, that you know, the Jews killed Jesus. And they have all these things. And they kind of get upset about the differences of who did it. But... He willfully laid it down for us, right? He's the one that took his life. He's the one that took his life in his own hands. I'm going to show you with a few verses right here. John chapter 15, verse 13 actually says, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You know, Jesus said that in John. And also in John, he also said this, that this, this should open it up real clearly that, you know, he was in total control. It says, John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18 says, Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. So nobody can say the Romans killed or that the, the Jews killed. In fact, if we, none of us would sin ever, if the garden would have never happened, if it would have never happened in the garden, and sin wouldn't have come about, he wouldn't have had to do it. So if anybody was to blame, it's every person on the face of this earth that's ever been born. But he's the one that chose to do that because he loves us. Like it says, it says no greater love than one to lay down his life for his friends. So uh, it was no, he knew what his mission was about. He knew exactly what he was doing, and he was no surprise to him what was coming. Not one bit. You know, when we focus on these about his disciples and how they were, you know, he sat there and he said that they were exceedingly sorrowful, right? Now, I wanted to go in and say, you know, and you, when you look at Luke, it says that it was hidden from them. The saying was it was hidden and they didn't perceive it. You know, I believe the reason why it was sorrowful to them, why they were sorrowful, and it was because they had a hardened heart about his resurrection. They had a hard time believing his resurrection, right? You know, immediately, you remember Peter sit there and said, it's not, you're not going to die. They didn't want to hear about his death. And that's understandably. Nobody wants to see their person that they're following, person that they love, a person they believe is the king of Israel, a person also that they believe is the, is the Messiah. They don't want to see him die. I can understand that completely in that part of sorrowfulness. But I want to show you this, because where do you get where it says that they did not understand it or perceive it, Right? Where do you see those parts where it says, you know, and they were even afraid to ask him about it, you know, because the, the, they were scared. They were fearful of what he would say. You know, he's already told them how many times, you know, he just said, I think we was learning last week, how long am I going to be with you? How long am I going to put up with you? So they were, they were probably scared to ask him, like, I don't know if I want to ask him this, you know. We're supposed to know something about this. And they had it in their mind, but they, it was hidden from them. You know, Mark, if you actually turn to Mark chapter 16, verse 14, Mark chapter 16, verse 14, or just write it down. It says that later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table. This is inside, right? And he rebuked their unbelief and their hardness of heart, Right? Because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. This is after his death and resurrection. So it shows when you look right here, he had an unbelief. They had an unbelief that was in their heart. 
They did not believe the resurrection. There was something to deal. They even had it all the way until after he was he had he had been hung on the cross. They didn't even though he had said time after time after time, right, that he would rise the third day. He didn't, you know, they didn't believe it. They had this hardness of their heart. And you know, that takes me back. Do you remember uh, uh, back in Matthew chapter 13? You remember that prophecy that was fulfilled in Isaiah? And I'm going to read that prophecy, but this was when he was telling the parables, right? The parables of the sowers and stuff. And, 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 and they said, why do you say this to us? Tell the people the parable but not tell them the explanation, not tell them. And then, you know, he explained it to them later on. He said, though, that this was for, you know, that, that it was because of their hardness of heart. And in Isaiah, he said, this is fulfilled in Isaiah. It says, you know, when you look at Matthew chapter 13, 14, and 15, it says, and in them, this pro- the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, hearing you will hear and shall not understand. Seeing you will see and not perceive. For their, for the hearts of this people have grown dull, and their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes have closed. Least they should with their eyes and hear with their ears, see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Least they should understand with their hearts and turn so I should heal them, so that I should heal them. You see, so... If they would have went to Jesus, see, they were they were already doing the wrong thing by by being afraid to ask him. They should have went and said, Lord, forgive us. Like we learned last week about the, the man that had the son. Help my unbelief, right? If they would have sit there and, and, and went to the disciples, I mean the disciples would have went to Jesus and said, Help our unbelief, we don't understand. He would have turned. But they, this part goes even for us Christians. You see, this is the 11. Even for us Christians, we have parts of this, this word that we don't believe, that we don't understand, and we don't trust. He wants us to trust all of Him as a little child. I remember being a little child, and I remember my daddy telling me stuff And I had no doubt in my mind what my daddy said was true. And that's the way he wants us to be him, to follow him as little children. You know, and so I think the way I believe is that that hardness was because they had that that disbelief about the resurrection. They didn't understand those scriptures because it was hidden from them because their disbelief and they didn't turn to him and ask. So it was hidden. So that's a blessing that they could have had. They could have been like, wow, I actually believe. Look at all the things that they had seen. Now, we started out in this chapter with the transfiguration in chapter 17. And we're fixing to go and we're going to actually end with the tax, right? You, have, you, you start out with a king in all his glory, and then you got the king in his humility. If you think about this, the king started out in all his glory at the beginning of this chapter. And at the end of this chapter, we see him paying taxes, his temple tax. But there's a reason it, when it's in his humility, it's in his, he's always doing stuff. You know, he was humiliated when he was on that cross for us and died. You know, could you imagine being stripped down and beat? And it says so bad that it was. It, it, that no, no, nobody couldn't even tell he was a man. He was beat so bad. So, our King, our Lord, you know, is 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 a gracious, great, and wonderful God. Now let's look at uh, verse twenty four when we start looking into the uh, temple taxes. In the New King James Version here where I like to preach at, it's the title of it is showing the titles. It says, Peter and his master pay their taxes. You know, verse 24 actually says, When they had come into Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the temple tax? So, 
to put in a little backdrop here and, and, I, and, and with some of the things that I was reading, one of the things that, that, that I see is that it's not like today. Jesus, you know, and his disciples, they were traveling all over. You know, today you can go to online and, and pay your taxes, right? You can go and, and do things that you have to pay your, you know, whatever it is. You can do those those type type things pretty instantly. Well, Jesus was walking all all around all of Israel and you you know Jerusalem and, and all the different areas all the way up to uh, as we seen up to Lebanon and, and Jordan and, and those areas that we see. Uh, he would have been walking around, and it didn't you know it's not like today where we can drive somewhere and it takes us a couple hours. It took them a couple of weeks, so. Maybe they were behind on the taxes that, you know, they, they pay at a certain time of every year that these guys came to them. But I actually believe that this part where you sit near, uh, uh, it says that they were doing, saying this in sort of a, uh, uh, a rude way or in, in like a way to try to, to get some answers. You know, there was some, some answers they were trying. Does your teacher not pay the temple tax, Right. And, and so the way they were saying it was like, you know, and, and, and also that they came to Peter. They didn't come to, they, they, they lured Peter off. They found Peter by himself, you know. To give you a history of the temple tax, and, and I'm going to go through some stuff. The temple tax was a Pacific tax, a Pacific type of tax that was collected to support the upkeep and maintenance of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. So it's not a civil tax like many people. I, I, I've heard people, I've read commentaries that some people believe it was like a civil tax, but it was more like a, a, an upkeep tax, an upkeep thing. And where I've read that it originated from, and I'm going to go to uh, Exodus, 11, Exodus chapter 30, verses 11 through 16. Exodus chapter 30, verses 11 through 16. And, th and this right here is, is where Moses took up some money, some offering. Uh, it says right here in verse 11 in Exodus, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, When you take a census of the children of Israel for their number, then every man shall give a ransom for himself to the Lord when you number them, that they may be no plague among them when you number them. This is what everyone among those who are numbered shall give, a half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. It says the half shekel is to be offered, be an offering to the Lord, everyone including those who are numbered from 20 years old and above shall give the offering to the Lord. The rich shall not give no give more, and the poor shall not give less than a half a shekel. When you give an offering to the Lord to make atonement to for yourselves, and you shall take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of meeting, and that it may be a memorial for the children of Israel before the Lord to make an atonement for yourselves. So one of the things we see in the history of it, when we look at this, we see that it was this half shekel was, you know, and, and, and what a lot of people have said, because it doesn't really connect the two or not really connected in our scripture, that it, through time, as they would collect this, as they then got the temple, they would move up. They would move up. And, and, and as then they got the temple, they just moved it from the tabernacle to the temple. And so that would be, you know, where the tradition is and, and of what was being said. And there's many things I'm going to show that will uh, kind of give you an idea of, of this a little bit more clear. But this would be like the beginning parts of the history of it, where it would originate from. And so some more history, the practice was, like I said, the practice was later extended 
to the upkeep of the temple in Jerusalem. You want to look a little bit more detail in it? It's in Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 32, and in 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verses 6 through 9. There's some verses there that you can see where it was like extended from the tabernacle into the temple, right? Here's some few here's a few key points of the temple tax. Again, the purpose was to be uh, was collect the funds to expense to fund the expenses associated with operation, maintenance, and service of the temple in Jerusalem. Included and this included activities such as sacrificing, offering, repairs, and other necessary functions. The amount of the currency of this tax was the tax was generally assessed a half a shekel, which is a specific weight of silver. The exact value of the half shekel could vary over time in different regions, but the the use of of the Pacific way was to help ensure uniformity and fairness, right? The collection, the temple tax was collect, uh, was typically collected annually from Jewish men of a certain age, usually 20 years old or older, and has been uh, who and it was seen as an obligatory obligation for every Jewish male to contribute. The tax was usually collected during a specific time, period of time around the Passover festivals, which you see we're coming close to that in our, in our studies. The religious symbolism that was about the, the temple tax, the temple tax, you know, was, the, was a, a way for the Jewish people to actively participate in the support of the temple which was a central place of worship and sacrifice. It symbolized their dedication to the worship of God and their unity of, com of community. The observation of the temple tax served the Lord as a reminder for the Jews for the redemption of Israel because it started back there in Exodus when it was. And also, you know, uh, that would uh, uh, also when you look at Exodus verse the, the 16, you'll see that it was to do as a memorial for the children of Israel to be, a, uh, be before the Lord to make an atonement for yourselves. You know, so there was some exceptions though, right? When we look at, like I said earlier, how come these guys came to collect it? How come they said it the way they said it? You know, there were certain uh, exemptions. For instance, is certain religious leaders, including priests and rabbis, were exempt from paying the temple tax. You know, so in their tradition, some of those people were, they didn't have to be, have to pay their temple tax. So, you know, as we will learn, when they come up there, you you got to remember this. Uh, uh, you know, Picture this now. I want you to I want you to sit back and I want you to picture what's going on right here. It says, you know, verse twenty four. To read it again, it says, when they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter. Now, where was Peter? Where do you guys remember where Peter lived? Where his home was? Where his his wife would have probably been at? You know, because he was married. He had a mother in law, right? And so. He he would he was from Capernaum. That was where he was. Uh, that's where he lived. So they came to him, and because they probably knew him well, you know, they probably knew exactly who he was and everything. And it, but they asked him, "Does your teacher not pay the temple tax?" You know, uh, one of the things I picture of Jesus. I mean, I picture Peter being outside. You know, in my mind's eye. I picture Peter being outside of his home, probably somewhere, collecting the, you know, and the, the people of the, the temple tax came to collect, you know, the collectors and ask him, you know, that question, does your, does your teacher not? You know, they were probably posing this question, you know, and one of the reasons why, I, you know, when you look back at that verse that I just was talking about, about certain people being exempt from it, you know, one of the questions was posed to Peter whether Jesus paid his uh, temple tax was probably uh, a lot deeper. You know, the, they were probably, by asking the question, the collectors were indirectly probing Jesus' identity 
as his role as a rabbi or a teacher. You know, that that could be a a reason why they came to him and said it that way. Uh, They were looking, you know, as you've seen, all the scribes and Pharisees, they were always kind of looking for a way to get him, to trap him, you know, through all the different things. So they were looking, you know, of, of, of the different things that were said. And, you know, during that time, like I said, it was common practice for the uh, priests and rabbis. And it says by, you know, asking him, you know, I I wrote down, by asking if Jesus paid the temple tax, the collectors were essentially questioning whether Jesus himself saw himself as a legitimate rabbi, you know, worthy to be of that exemption. You know, then what does Peter say? Peter always gets in trouble, you know, you know, it, 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 if you think about it, at the transfiguration, Peter was interrupted by the Father, right? As he was speaking, I'm going to make this temple to Moses and one to Elijah. God said, this is my son whom I love. Hear him. Right here, as we see, verse 25, it says, he said, yes, Right? He told the, the, the collectors, he said, yes, he pays them. And then when he was going into his house, you remember I said, I picture him being outside his house. It says, and when he had come into his house, Jesus anticipated him saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take their customs or taxes? From, from their sons or from strangers? Right? Right? So, you know, when you, look, when you look at this, when you look at what is going on, you can see he just come out and said yes. You know, one of the better things that we would probably have learned is that what, what Peter should have said is probably looked like, why don't you go ask Jesus for himself? You know, he's right here. Go ask him whether he does. Instead of just saying yes, Peter, uh, you know, Peter basically is getting interrupted by Jesus as he's coming in. Peter thinks he said, yes, he thinks that was a a wise question, but immediately Jesus anticipated. It says he anticipated him. That word is in the the actual King James Version, it says prevented him. But it means he got in front of it. He knew what was said, and he he stopped him, and he says, he says, what what do he say? He says, what do you think, Simon? You know, uh, Think, you know, you know, Jesus was quite capable of, you know, like I said, he should have let Jesus answer it. You know, Jesus was quite capable of answering that question himself. Think about, think about the implications right here when, when, you, when you look at this and you see that Jesus is coming to him and asking him a question about what he answered. He already preconceived, you know, he's seen that, that, that he, he knew what Peter was thinking in his head. He said, just just think about it. Sometimes, you know, we need to follow that, not the example of Peter, but what we're learning here is sometimes, you know, we don't need to just answer a question a lot of times to sometimes people. You know, we may, people may ask us a question. We may not know the correct answer 100%. You know, sometimes it's better to tell them to go ask Jesus for himself. You know, a lot of times, you know, I can't give you that answer. Let's go look at it through the, what the Word says. You know, when I say ask Jesus, you go to His Bible, His Word right here. And, and you could tell them, you know, go read the Bible and see what it says itself. What does it say about whatever they're asking, you know, their selves? So I, I see some, some things that we can take right here for our, our, ourselves that we can take. Just don't answer out things that we will sometimes, you know, be wrong in saying we want to try to get right what we say to people and obviously jesus right here anticipating already knew that and then bringing up he called him simon you know that was another thing that that we're going to go over and when jesus had come into the house he anticipated you know i picture like i said him going into the house and jesus stops him because him being God, right? And you see, God in the flesh. We learn that in John chapter 1 through 14. John chapter uh, 1, 1 through 14, right? We see that. It says that, uh, you know, he knew what was said. You know, Jesus knew what was said and wanted to correct him on his thinking 
being correctly, right? It, you know, when you ask this, it says, what do you think, Simon? From, from whom do kings collect, uh, kings of the earth take customs or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? You know, when I see this, when you see, you know, when, when, Jesus, when you see Jesus calling him Simon, you know, that has significance right there. What did we see at the beginning, you know, earlier, not actually in the beginning of this chapter, but in the last chapter, chapter 16, when they were in uh, Philippi, Caesarea Philippi, right? What did, what did Jesus call him? Jesus gave him a new name. He called him Peter, meant rock, right? Small rock, small stone. He said he called him Peter, and that was because... Why did he say that? Because he said, you know, he was the, the Christ, the son of the living God. He knew, he said, you remember he said, my, my father, you had not learned this from flesh and blood, but from my father, right? So now we look at him, he's calling him Simon. He's going back to his old name again. He's going back. And so I would say by the implications of that, it's like you, you're moving backwards, about me you're 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 faltering in how you believe about me in a way you know so he takes him back he brings him back imagine being called a new name being called hey you're 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 one of these rocks you know that i'm you know you know that what you just said the father's giving you all this and now i'm going to take you right back jesus is now calling you by your old name that would probably be like oh that's not good you know, that wouldn't be good. You know, another thing about, uh, you know, this, like I said, you know, when you look at this first, did you know this? And I'm going to give you a little bit of history on this or a little bit of, of things to think about. Did you know this was only recorded by Matthew? It's not recorded by, by any of the other disciples, but it's recorded, or, or any of the other Gospels, it's recorded by Matthew. And Matthew, being a tax collector, I'm sure he was probably interested in this. I'm per, pretty sure that, that, that Jesus probably talked to him and said, you know, listen up, this is something. This is why, you know, he, he knew this, and he focused, you know, and what... Matthew's reason uh, being when he's writing it, we found out that he had the, the kingship. You know, this is everything that Matthew wrote is about the king, right? And, and what they do. So Matthew tells us that uh, Jesus, from like I said, from whom do the kings of the earth? He's using that word kings as him being the king. He's showing Peter from whom do the kings of this earth collector time what jesus is trying to show right here peter is that just as the royal families of the earth are exempt from taxes paying taxes also himself being the christ the son of the living god should be exempt from paying the temple tax so in a way you're looking at what he's saying he says from sons or from strangers the very next thing he says, Jesus says to him, so then the sons are free, right? Then, then that's what he asked him. He said, then the sons are free. Nevertheless, because, because Peter actually in verse 26, Peter says, let me read the whole thing. Peter says to him from strangers, not from their sons, but from strangers. And then Jesus said to him, Then the sons are free. Nevertheless, we offend them. Go to the sea and cast in the hook and take the first fish that comes. And when you've opened his mouth, you'll find a piece of money. Take and give it to them for, for me and for you. So did you know this was the only, only miracle right here? that Jesus performed to meet his own needs. It's the only one performed to meet his own needs. You remember, do you remember in, when Jesus was in the wilderness? One of the things that uh, Satan come up to him, you can read that in Matthew 4 and Mark 1 and Luke chapter 4. 
But one of the things, you remember it was tur turning stone into bread, right? The devil tried to tempt him to do that, to satisfy his hunger. Also, jumping off the temple. You know, you remember when the devil said that? Just jump off this temple. You know, the angels aren't going to let you even hurt your foot on a stone. Plus, can you imagine what that would have done if he would have jumped off the temple and floated down and all them priests and everybody, they'd have been like, wow, this is, this is God. You got to see, here's Jesus, God. You know, it, that was uh, uh, selfish. That would have been selfish to, for Jesus to do stuff like that. You know, but when you want, when I sit there and look at this verse right here, we see never, he says, then the sons are free. Nevertheless, lest we offend them. See, even when Jesus performed this miracle to meet his own needs, he was still meeting the needs of others. Because what did he say? Least we offend them. Right? He, did, he, he did, didn't just selfishly involve himself. So a lot of times when we look like we were looking, and, and I'm trying to put these together with you. You remember last week we were talking about you know, how come your prayers might not be answered? A lot of times, you know, you remember it was because we might want to spend it on our own, what we want. See, Jesus didn't ask for that money and, and do all the stuff. He didn't really ask for it. He made it happen. He already knew it all ahead of time. But he didn't bring that money there for his own selfish need. But, you know, it was also for others who were involved in it. You know, he didn't want to offend them. And, and, and we need to think about that because, you know, he, you know, he didn't want to. It was, as I was reading in the commentaries, he didn't want to offend uh, the people. You know, you know as I wrote down, he, didn't want, he did not want people to be offended because him being a Jewish, right? And he did not support the temple ministry. He didn't really support that. There was many things, you know. Once again, when I said, let's go back and look at where it originated from and some of the traditions of where it came from in Exodus, right? It doesn't, anywhere in here in the Bible, nowhere in the law does it say they had to have that temple tax. That was for the tabernacle, and that's what that was for. They extended it on over to, into the temple, but nowhere did it say you know, he didn't want, he didn't, it nowhere, you know, it didn't break the law. As one commentary says, you know, he never broke the law, but he didn't have an issue with disregarding man made traditions either. Right? And I'm going to bring this to a, a, a thing. Because a lot of times when we look at that temple tax, we also look at our tithes, right? Our tithes and our offering. We can almost put those two together. Because what it's for? Our tithes and our offerings are for the church to maintain our building and to do those things, right? And, and so when we look a lot of times, you know, and for the expenses to do with the church. Now, everybody knows that, that you have to maintain a church. You have to pay for that to be done. It just doesn't happen. Everybody knows that it has to happen, you know, in order to maintain, in order to, to have things, in order to do things. You know, but, 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 you know, one of the things is he says when you remember when he, when he was sitting there and he told, you know, as, as we learned, he sit there and he said, when you got something to give, like a gift, you, you get it, get it right in your heart first. And he also doesn't want you to give, you know, that something out of a begrudging heart, but he wants to give out of a, uh, out of your heart. He doesn't want you to give out of, out of. Uh, you have to give this much and you don't like it. He doesn't bless that kind of giving. He blesses the kind of giving from your heart what you want to do, right? And so, you know, as you see, they had a certain amount and nowhere did it say. But now here's the thing. Here's something to think, uh, to think about. He didn't want to offend them people. You know, he didn't want to offend them because of it, so he went ahead and paid it. In his humility... He just went ahead and paid it. He could have sat there and said, I am the king of Israel. He could have went up there and said that. He could have went and done many of those things and been, and been, why should I have to pay it? But he didn't want to offend the people because of that. You know? 
But he did make it uh, uh, known that you give from your heart, right? You know, many that I read, many of the people that I read, he said they believe, uh, you know, that, that Jesus believed in this matter, being a small issue, was unnecessary to offend. And in fact, one of the commentaries I read says this was, but believing it being a small issue, it was unnecessary to offend others who have not yet understood the mysteries of his coming. See, they didn't understand. People wouldn't even have understood the mysteries of his coming, meaning they would not have understood who he was. So by him not giving that tax could have kept the person from, you know, not believing in him, not believing later on. Or could have offended them. Or, they, they, you know, how many times have you heard somebody say something or done something that offended you and maybe you've never, ever listened to that person again? This was such a small matter. The thing about tithes and offerings when you hear sermons and people talk about, it's not, it's not, it's not worth enough to, to go and argue about those things doesn't hurt hurt me i would much rather people have that little bit of tradition if they wanted than to offend them about it and 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 turn around and where they they don't never want to listen to me ever again it's not really worth that we but we all know there's things and there's things all over you can look at eschatology you know, you can look at the things about prophecy. There's many things in the Bible that the Bible says are true, right? And, it, and, and maybe they didn't understand those things because they didn't actually believe them earlier when we looked at the money. You remember the, not the money, but looked at him predicting his death, right? You, you know, we went through. They didn't really, maybe certain people don't believe certain things about eschatology because they were taught. There's many different denominations, many different things out there that, that believe differently. But, you know, our main part is we want people to come to the knowledge of Jesus, come to the cross and be saved. If, if they don't believe certain things about the Bible, it's not a big deal to try to force that onto somebody. And that was the same thing I believe that Jesus is saying here. At least we offend them. Because he was thinking about others right there. He was thinking about he would rather them come to him, not worried about a temple tax. So let's pay it. Plus, he didn't really even have to. You know, when I think about it, he didn't even really have to pay it because he already knew where that fish, the fish... Somebody else paid it for him because somebody dropped the water, dropped the, fish, the, the coin in the water, right? And then he had the fish. So, you know, we're free in regard of that, of that part of the law. We're free in regard to, you know, we have a freedom, right? Where it says the sons are free. You know, that also implies to Peter right there too, you know, because we're sons of God too, once you become. So we're free from those things. Now, look at Romans chapter 6, verse 14. Let me read that to you. It says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Right? So we're not to use our freedoms that we get to offend people. You know, one of the things... Going back and still looking as a Christian, it, it, Warren Wiersbe actually says, he says, as Christians, we must never use our freedoms in Christ to hurt or destroy others. Technically, Jesus did, did not have to pay the, the tax, but for practical reasons, he paid it. He also included Peter so that their testimony would not be heard. Right? Now, I wanted to look up some Bible verses that, that, that went with that. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says, But beware, at least somehow, this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. Right? And so you can look at those 
That those are a weak, a stumbling block. You know, sometimes we have our freedoms. We could sit there and say, you know, be any which way we are about it and go and, you know, you know, just like we were sitting there, uh, uh, you know, I was discussing with, with my wife, a lot of times people do things on Sundays. You know, I don't want to do things on Sundays like cut my grass much because then it's like you think about it, people are like, well, you know, he should have been in church. You know, and so they they take the Sunday a lot of times, even as the Sabbath, even though it's the first day of the week. If you study, the Sabbath is actually from Friday evening at da, at dawn at, at dusk, and and I mean dawn to dusk. You know, it's Saturday evening. So from from when it gets dark to when it gets dark on Saturday, that's actually uh, Sabbath. And when you look that up, another thing is uh, Galatians chapter five verse thirteen. It says, "For you, brethren, have been called into liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another." See, that's what Jesus was doing right here. He was didn't want to offend him. He was serving others by paying his tax. He didn't want to offend them. You know, the decision not only to avoid unnecessary defense, uh, offenses, but also uh, it was for both Peter, Jesus and Peter to maintain a positive, you know, uh, and respectful testimony. So sometimes when you look at it, you want to remain that positive testimony in what you do. You know, we, we, like I said, we as Christians should never go out and offend people of what that is. So now we look at, you'll find a piece of money. You know, I'm, I'm kind of going through this whole verse because this whole verse is long. And it's, it's, it's loaded with stuff. So it's the only piece, only miracle using money. Did you, did, did you know that? You know, as I said, the tax had it or it, its origin in the days of Moses. You know, chapter Exodus 30. The original tax money was used to make actual, when you look at it in Exodus 38, it was used to make the silver sockets on the tabernacle poles that were erected. That actual money that they took up at that point. And you can look at that in Exodus 38, 25 through 27. Uh, an interesting picture I found, there's a uh, uh, some guys named Ron White that I've seen and it showed I just put this picture up because there's some some castings out in the Sinai in in Sinai area Mount Sinai where I believe that to be there's there's uh was some furnaces that were found and they they discovered how you know like people make a furnace where they melt metals and melt stuff and there's actual molds that they found that that they were using it the archaeology archaeological evidence and uh i put that it's not only uh i connected it with the playlist of archaeological evidence i i'm gonna put it in the description on this on this video if y'all wanted to go through there and look uh not not saying that everything that ron white believed i believe you're, you know i'm not promoting i just like the archaeological parts of it and uh everything like that so but you look at this there was a redemptive parallel right the observation of the temple tax that served as a reminder for the jews of their redemption right in of their uh redemption from their egyptian slavery when he pulled them out of egypt right that's what they went to mount sinai and just as the temple tax you know symbolized the deliverance christians us understand our redemption through the precious blood of Jesus. So we can see some, some parallels right here. Now, you remember when I was sitting there telling you about traditions and I was bringing up that it's really not? One of the things you look right here, it says 1 Peter chapter... Now, Peter would have known this better than all of us because he had that you know, first-hand uh, account with Jesus. Peter chapter uh first peter chapter 1 verse 18 and 19 actually says knowing that you were redeemed you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold for your aimless conduct 
received by the traditions of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. See, they were using that as that, that temple tax as the symbolism as being, hey, we were redeemed. And, 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 and it actually says as a memorial. You know, when we look down and we look back, it said as that memorial unto the Lord uh, for, for you. you, you know, and back in Exodus 30, uh, six, verse 16. So, going on to this, about this. You remember when he says, go into the sea and cast a hook and take out the first fish that comes? Did you know this is the only miracle using one fish? One fish. Someone losing a coin. You know, think about this. The intricacy of the details of its divine nature. Someone losing a coin in the water, right? Right? The fish taking the coin, eating it. The same fish being caught with the coin in its mouth. Right? And that points to, you know, the situation. That yeah, points to the intricacy, intri intricacy and unlikeliness, unlikely to be explained by natural causes. That was a miracle in itself. You know, it surpasses the bounds of just human management. Nobody could just manage, hey, I'm going to feed this coin out. out and, and to, it, it was a miracle. And Jesus, knowing that, you know, it shows his divine authority, right, over creation. You know, another thing, it says, take it from you to me, right? This was a, performed for Peter. You know, back with uh, Warren Wearsby, you know, it, this was uh, uh, performed for Peter, right? This was one of many miracles that were performed for Peter. He healed Peter's mother-in-law. You'd see that in Mark chapter 1, verse 29 and 34. He helped Peter to catch fish. You remember all the fish? He told him to throw the nets over. He enabled Peter, you know, to walk on the water, right? And that was in Matthew 14. He healed uh, Malachus' ear. You remember his ear got, Peter chopped his ear off and Peter put it back on right there for him. Right? And, uh, you know, and he delivered Peter from prison. So this is another performance, you know, that not performance, but another uh, 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 miracle performed for Peter. You know, and if you think about it, even when Peter came into the house, just, just think about it. Jesus knew exactly what the conversation was about. That in itself is no different from when uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the other disciple's name that he was underneath the fig tree. And you remember him, you remember the, the disciple saying underneath the fig tree and he says this is a man and he knew what he was thinking underneath the fig tree. And uh, I, I just can't you know, recall his name exactly right now. But uh, uh, one of the disciples... And uh, I probably should have wrote that down in here, so that would help me out. Anyways, it just that is another divine of of his divinity. Another thing that shows his divinity. You know, when it says, uh, you know, we we look at what he did for Peter, also for you and me. You know, Jesus knows what we need before we even ask it. Peter need was was met was Peter Jesus knew what Peter's need was and he was able to meet that need right Psalms chapter 5 uh, 55 verse 22 says cast your burdens on the Lord and he shall sustain you he shall never permit the righteous to be moved so cast your cares on him one of the things we see, is that Peter listened to Jesus also, right? Because he told, because he was told to go to 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 take that hook, and to, and the first fish he caught to check for that one to see the coin. Just think about it. Peter was normally used to fishing with nets, and he could have easily went out there and threw a net off and then grabbed some fish. And, he said, you know, he could have said, well, I have better luck if I find 
go through all these fish's mouth. But Jesus told him to go out and cast a hook. And the first fish you catch is going to have that coin. Right? Peter listened to what our Lord said. Many people, how many people would sit there and say, I could probably do it better. Let me go do this. So we need to listen, you know, to what the Word says. And do it like the, what the Word says. Uh, Philippians, uh, you know, actually James chapter 1, verse 22 says, But be doers of the Word and not hearing, hearers only, deceiving yourselves. How many of us listen to what the Word says and we don't really go do it? See, Peter could have heard what Jesus said and just, just cast it off. Just, just said, oh well, okay. We ain't going to have no, you know. He could have been that away. There's many of us. How many times do we do that? He was a fisherman. But... He was a fisherman. And, and, and so, you know, he went out there. You know, think about this. If we would only listen to him, He'll also meet our needs. You know, that was last week in some of the things. If we would only listen to Him. You know, it says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, it says, And my God shall supply all your needs according to His riches and glory of Jesus Christ. So He will meet your needs, you know. But you got to remember all of the things. You can't do it because you want it a lot of times. A lot of people want things. I, I want things, you know. But that's not what he's, he's not wanting for our own selfish desires. He's got, he's got needs that he'll meet your needs. You know, that reminds me of a, 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 a couple that I met years ago. And they didn't have a whole lot. I would say they were fairly poor. Uh but I remember him coming up to me one day and he said, he says, you know, I may not have a lot, but I'll tell you this, I've never went hungry. I've always had a roof over my head. No, I've always been out of the rain. So, you know, and he, and he trusted the Lord. So I, I, I think, you know, we may not have our circumstances might be what we want, but... He'll meet your needs. You know, I wanted to uh, end with this. I want you to think about this. In the beginning of this chapter, chapter 17, we see the transfiguration, right? And man is restored to his original purpose, right? You, we see that with, with, with Jesus and Moses and Elijah, right? Right? We see, Jesus the Son, God the Father, were in perfect fellowship with Moses and Elijah. They weren't hiding their face like Moses had to crawl in the cave, right? They didn't. They were in perfect, right? They were perfect. It was restored in the beginning of this, this chapter. In the garden, you know, just like in the garden. I, I actually put down Genesis chapter 3, 8, when, you know, after the fall, it says they heard the sound of the Lord walking, Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said, Where are you? You know, when we was listening to that song earlier in the garden, you know, that's, you know, that, that communication, that, that, you know, fellowship. That was our original purpose. And we see Moses and Elijah. We see also where Moses, you know, like I said, hid himself in the cave. He couldn't see him. He could only see his backside. You know, at the end of this chapter, we see the original performance being restored. And, and you say, well, what does that, where is that at? So, when you look, what did he say? He said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish and over the, of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle of the earth, and over every creepeth thing that creepeth on the earth. That's in Genesis chapter 126. 
Jesus in his humanity, right, was able to control everything about that fish. He had that fish eat and bring it up and actually grab that hook. We see that part. We see a glimpse. We, just like we see in the transfiguration, we see a glimpse of our purpose and we see a glimpse of our performance being restored. Because as what, what does Jesus say? He says, as, you know, he, he said that we would have dominion over. Shows his dominion over that. Jesus, and you've got to remember this, Jesus as both fully divine and fully human exercised dominion over creation. Just as God initially granted dominion over human, uh, to humanity over creation, over creation in Genesis, Jesus' authority over the fish and the miracles showcased that fulfillment in his original mandate. So we can see that fulfillment. That's a glimpse, people. That's what you have to look forward to. He's going to create a new heavens and a new earth, right? And it says the, the lion will lay down with the lamb and the baby will play with the serpent, the viper, right? And so we're going to... It's just a wonderful thing. It says no mind, you know... I was talking with Matthew last night. No mind has seen or imagined the things which God has in glory for us. We just get to see a glimpse of this. You know, being His, coming to Him, being a son, being free. It's amazing what was right there in just this verse right here, just this, this text. It's amazing when you break it down. I thank the Lord because that's deep. That's to me is deep. That that that's 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 knowledgeable. And the whole chapter, like I said, him going from the king of glory to his humility, king of humility. So, and he shows us how we should be. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you today. We just come to you and I just give you all the glory for your word. Lord, Holy Spirit, help this word sink into us. Father God, just as you said to Peter, you know, like Jesus said to you, he says, you wouldn't have known this except for my Father who, who, who revealed it to you. Lord, reveal to every person who hears your word. Lord, Lord hear to every person who in this world who he is and have them come into this kingdom have them come into you to know you lord lord we pray and we we love you and we thank you lord we know that 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 you're for us not against us and that you'll meet all our needs thank you dear jesus amen